segment of Junior Appalachian Musicians Presents, Jim Lloyd interviews legendary musician Herb Key of Wilkes County, North Carolina. My actual name is Herbert Milton Key, K-E-Y. And you've been living in Wilkesboro how long now? I was born in Wilkesboro. I've been living here for 83 years. Okay. And what got you, what got you interested in music? I got interested in music uh, when I was just a small boy. Uh, as I recall, my daddy was away in the, in the Army in World War II, and all we had was a radio, and it had static on it, and you couldn't hear much. But we listened to the radio, and my grandmother had a wind-up Victrola. I've actually got it now. But she... She would wind up the Victrola and play 78. She wouldn't let me wind it up. She was afraid I'd break the spring. <laughs> and she'd wind it up, and I'd sit in the floor, and she'd put on tunes like The Wildwood Flower with Mother Maybell playing the guitar. I probably wasn't over four or five years old when I first heard that. And I decided I wanted to do that. Now, you had seen your mother play some, you said. Mother played a little bit. She played a G chord, like what we call a whole handle G, you know, straight across. And she could play some chords, and she showed me a few chords. And my, my daddy, he wasn't too interested in me playing. He thought I would be hoeing corn. But your dad played too. My dad played a little, but he was away in the war. And during the years I was trying to learn most, all I had was mom. The wind-up Victrola and the radio. Now, you told me one time about his saying about the owls. Do you remember that? Wait a minute. No, the saying about the owl. The, the owl and the eagles. Oh, he, he told me, he said, you can't fly as high as an eagle and hoot all night like an owl. He said, if you, he said, you got to get in the bed early and get some rest so you can fly like an eagle. If you stay out and hoot all, hoot all night, this was later on in life that he told me that. If you stay out and hoot like an owl, you won't fly like an eagle the next day. Well, that's probably a pretty wise saying. I yeah. <laughs> I'd forgotten about that. When you uh, when you first started really really getting into the music and, and coming out, and you saw uh, Doc Walsh and you saw Clarence Ashley and those guys like that, what did you think of them playing out like that? Well, I decided that that's what I wanted to do. I mean, I, I wanted to play music. I, I wanted to play like Mother Maybell. And then later on, I got to hear and see Doc Watson. And I thought, my goodness, here's another guitar picker with another style. I want to learn that one too. How old were you when you saw Doc? I was probably 16 by then, 15 or 16. Where'd you see him at? I, I can't even remember. He played on the streets, and I may have seen him on the street. He played on the street in Boone a lot, and he also played on the street in town here a lot, or some, but not as much as Boone. I guess, I guess he didn't make as much money here as he did in Boone. But anyway, he played for contributions, and it was his way of supporting his family. And I was so impressed with his picking. You know, when I first started trying to play the guitar, I didn't know there was such a thing as a guitar pick. I did break the tooth out of one of Mama's combs, big hair comb, and used that to play with sometimes. Mama said something, said, my comb keeps getting broke. I don't know what's going on here. I quit doing that. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you, uh, do you remember the first time you met Doc? Personally? Well, I think I saw him and spoke to him at a fiddler's convention. He, he used to play in competition some. I didn't know that. Yes, he did back then. And his son was with him that time. I can't think of his name. Merle. Merle. Merle was with Doc at a fiddler's convention, and I walked up and spoke to him, and they were both very friendly and cordial and nice. But, you know, 
I guess he had a lot of other people to speak to. He just wanted to go ahead and speak and move along. Now, a lot of people don't know now in this modern world we live in, they don't know about the Saturday morning radio shows like you played. Oh, well, when I, went, when I was in school, I just had started in high school, and I was, I was in a group called the Future Farmers of America, FFA. And several other boys were in there that played music, and we were friends, so we formed a band. It was Cecil, Cecil Johnson and Otis Campbell and myself and maybe a couple of others. And we got an opportunity to play on the radio at WKBC live on Saturday. Back then, they had Saturday shows. They had an auditorium. An audience would come. It was free. They would listen while we played on the radio. Well, back, backstage back there, they had a room with what we call cubby holes. Each, each band that played on the radio, there were more than one, several. Each, each band had a little hole they put their mail in during the week. And then on Saturday, when we came in to play, we would get that out and read it live on the air. Well, we were playing and doing good and getting requests, and people would send in letters. Back then, there wasn't anything but the mail and the telephone, and, you know, we didn't even have a telephone then. So most of the requests you got were by mail. And I was getting a letter about every week or maybe every other week. It said, get Herbie to play one, sing one. Get Herbie to sing one. Love, brown eyes. And I thought I had a, I had a fan. <laughs> Turns out it was my mother. <laughs> she was supporting me. She, she wanted me to play music, but my dad really didn't. Did he ever say anything to you about it when you started playing out? No, he never did. He never did say anything about it except things like, you know, you can't stay out all night, hoop <laughs> like an owl, and soar like an eagle the next morning. Sometimes, you know, young people uh, they stay out too late. I've known you to still stay out too late. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you uh, you were pretty active. Well, you've been pretty active in music all your life. Yeah, yeah. So you, uh, after the radio show, after you got out of school, what happened? Well, we formed a band. <clears throat> I played in different configurations, and we used to get together at fiddlers' conventions and just play out in the field, you know, jam and play. So we decided, well, let's, let's form us a band. And we came up with Paul Gentle, myself, Larry Pennington, his uncle, Spencer Pennington. And then uh, we formed a band, and we got to play in at Fiddler's Conventions. We did well, but we never did win any prizes because back then, in order to play in competition, you had to have a fiddle player. So we got Johnny Miller to join us. And Johnny played fiddle, and along about that same time is when I'd met Wayne, Wayne Henderson. And Wayne and I were just interested in the same thing, instrument building. He was just trying to get started, and so was I. So I got Wayne to join the band and play lead guitar. So that made Larry, myself, Spencer, Johnny and Wayne, and we won the Galax Fiddlers Convention the very first year we played there. Huh. Now you had, you started playing bass at that time. Yeah. So when when did you take up the bass? Was it during that? Well, actually, I was playing bass mostly during this school band. Oh, okay. I they, thought you played they had before. a bass fiddle at school that I didn't even own one, but I got to play that one. So yeah. I played bass then. I wanted to play guitar, but. Seemed like there was always more guitar players than there was bass players. Now, when you when you took uh, when you were playing with the band, though, you didn't own a bass. Is that that's what you were telling me a while yeah, ago? Yeah, I played bass. Yeah, but you didn't own the bass. No, Larry Pennington owned, owned the bass actually, and uh, by then I was building instruments and I had built a banjo, 
And Larry wanted a banjo with a tone ring in it and all the bells and whistles. So I let him play my banjo and I played his bass <laughs> in that band. That's good. <laughs> now, when you, um, going back to the, uh, the radio station and then the Fiddler's Convention, how have things changed now over the years? What do you see different about the music and the musicians? Well, the music is not the same as it was. Uh, the music today is mostly just wham, bam, drums and rhythm. It's, it's just a an, an repetition of a line. There's no information in the songs. There's no stories to tell in the songs. There's actually no tune. It's just a repetitive thing. One line over and over and over and over. It's just, it's not even the same music. So I like the old songs that tell stories about events, tragic events sometimes, like the wreck of old 97 when 11 people got killed in a train wreck, and stories about uh, bank robberies and robbers and, you know, just big stories. Tunes today don't have any, any, any stories to them. They don't have any anything in them really. Now when you and Wayne and Larry were playing, that was some hard driving bluegrass. Yeah, uh, that's what we were playing. We we actually, well Larry, well, Larry could play uh, Don Reno style and Earl Scrugg style. He could play a banjo that way and it was mostly bluegrass. And Johnny was mostly a bluegrass fiddler too. So we were mostly just a bluegrass band. And there wasn't a whole lot of lead playing on guitars and bluegrass bands back then. So it was sort of unique to have Wayne Henderson could play a, a break and take the lead in a, in a tune, a fast bluegrass tune. Now, did you all do some radio shows too with that configuration? Well, I think we did, but I can't be specific about them. I, we... We did not play at WKBC. We may have played over at West Jefferson or somewhere like that. But by then, I think WKBC show had gone away. They moved out of that building, and they no longer had the auditorium, and they no longer had the, the free uh, music for people to come. It was it was an entirely different world then. It was like. It was almost like the Grand Ole Opry to us. We were playing in front of the audience and the audience could come in and listen to us. And then when we got through playing, another band would come on and they would play. It was Saturday. It was a whole Saturday filled with music almost. Yeah. And now we've seen the demise of even we've seen, 30 minutes of, we've of seen music. That, that go away. Do you have any speculation, Herb, on what caused that? Why are people not coming out like they used to? Well, no, I, I really don't. I guess there's too many other things. Uh, computers and cell phones and things that, that occupy people now that, that didn't have back then. In other words, back then, if you wanted to listen to some music, you most of the time had to go listen to it where they were playing or play a 78 record, or listen to it on the radio. Now, you did work for Doc Walsh for, Walsh for a time, didn't you? Well, now, yes, Doc, later in his later years, he got into uh, siding, house siding, and working on upgrading houses. And I worked with another fellow, and we did uh, mostly... Uh, siding on houses now drake was around drake walsh doc's son he yeah. was around through all that too wasn't he? he was around but i don't think he was very active in music at that time and doc had quit playing music at that time oh so you didn't you didn't get to play with doc at no, all no he didn't he didn't play then yeah he just come around and look at the job we were doing <laughs> <laughs> to approve or disapprove he was sort of like the contractor right got the jobs and me and this other fellow did the work Right. My daddy was a carpenter, and I grew up with carpenter work. 
And that's one reason that woodworking was so inter interesting to me because he worked with wood and building instruments was similar. We used some of the same tools. I've still got a lot of my daddy's hand saws and chisels and hand tools that we used back then. Huh. Huh. Did, uh, did your dad ever change his attitude about the music as he got older? Well, he, he accepted it and he, you know, he, 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 he was a, a deacon in church and we sang in church and I sang there too. They did not have anything but a piano. Of course, I didn't play much of an instrument then except the bass fiddle and a little bit of guitar. And I wanted to play more guitar, but mostly bass fiddle. And Did, uh, well, he, he lived to be pretty old, didn't he? Yeah, he was in his early 90s. And, but he still listened to music, even. Yeah, he listened to music. Of course, like like I said a minute ago, back then, you know, there wasn't much else to do except listen to music or listen to the radio. There wasn't there wasn't any all this other stuff. There wasn't any television. There wasn't. We didn't have a phone. Well, you know, when my coming up, which Dad, my father always had the radio on. Yeah. No matter what he was doing, if he was just sitting around or if he was working on something, he always had a radio. And uh, I think that's one of the things that I've noticed about people changing. They, You don't see people doing that like that anymore. No, no, they don't do that anymore. They, you know, even, even television is not as popular as it one time was. Right. And when you go, you go in any store now and there's music. Yeah, it's piped in, and so it's around all the time. But it's just not the same type of music, no, is not. No, it's not the same kind of music. It doesn't tell the stories, and, and it, it doesn't play the, the tunes that I like to hear. Who was um, who was your favorite? Uh, here in Wilkesboro, there was a big music scene. It always has been. Yeah. But who who was the 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 big boys when that you remember? But uh, Pre being around Doc Watson and them, who who were the ones on the radio that you listened to? Well, uh, I, you know Doc Walsh here from here that we talked about earlier. He had a band called the Carolina Tar Heels, I believe, and I always sort of liked their music, and I got to listen to some of their music. And, and mostly it was on recordings, 78s. I liked uh, Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs when they came along. I liked them. Did you ever get to see them? Seems like I did one time. They came to the courthouse in Wilkesboro. I think I went one time. Of course, back then, you know, we didn't even own a vehicle until my dad came back from the war. And... Um, we got a vehicle. I was getting on up there, 12 years old or something, before we ever owned a vehicle. So the only way we could go to town would be to ride the bus. And we'd ride the bus to town to get things. And, and then we'd get off at the, at the line, that city limit line. We'd get off and walk from there on home because it cost 15 cents to ride all the way home. But you could get off at the stop there at the line. For, for 10 cents. <laughs> Money pretty tight. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about the first guitar you had. First guitar I had was mother's old guitar. I still got it. It was a gondola. Uh, the strings on it were about that high. <laughs> and it, it was very difficult to play. And, and I guess that's one reason mama didn't play it much. It was hard to play. It needed an accent. Nobody knew about that back then. But I'd try to build up the calluses on my fingers so they wouldn't hurt so bad when you press the strings down. And I would actually go in the kitchen there to the wood cook stove and wet my fingers and stick them on that hot stove like that to, to make them tougher. Did it work? I think it did. It made my <laughs> fingers calloused more. And that's all I had to play. What was the first guitar that you had that was a good one? First guitar I got, uh, I guess I was 16. 
And mother and dad bought me one for Christmas. It came from Sears and Roebuck. It was a silver tone. And I thought that thing played like a dream. Of course, it, it, it had a pretty high action, but based on the other one, it was low. And then how long did it take you to where you got a Martin or a Gibson? Which one, what, what's the first expensive guitar that you had? Well, I remember this guy. I guess it was a Gibson that I would gotten a hold of. This guy came to me one day with a, with a Martin guitar. It had been painted all over. And, you know, I didn't even know what a Martin guitar was. And he wanted me to put strings on it for him. It was, had one or two broken strings. And I told him, I said, well, I, I don't even have any strings. I said, you know, when I break a string, I'll tie it together or go to town or next time I go or get somebody to go, I'll buy one string for 15 cents and replace that one string. I don't have any extra strings. He said, shucks. <laughs> I want some strings on that thing. He said, well, I, he said, you want the guitar? I said, well, yeah, what do you take for it? He said, $3. I said, I'll buy it. And I bought that Martin guitar from him for $3. <laughs> but how much were you making a day at that time? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Probably not much more not than, much more than yeah, $3. that much. <laughs> what about, now you told me a story one time about you buying a brand new I believe it was a Gibson, wasn't it? No, the brand new guitar that I bought was a Martin. I've still got it. It's in 1962. It cost $310. I've still got the tag in the case. I've still got the guitar. It was a Martin D28. And people in the community said, do you ever hear about Herb Key buying that guitar and paying over $300? I didn't even have a pot to pee in or a window to throw it out of. <laughs> they thought I was crazy for buying that guitar for $300, and it was a lot of money. I bet you were in heaven, though, when you had it, didn't you? Well, yeah, I still got it. That's great. <laughs> what, uh, do you have any particular memory that sticks out from playing? Is there anything that really sticks out? And I know all the years that you've done it, the, the, the shows will blend together and things like that. And a lot of times the backstage happenings are pretty funny too. Well, you know, later on in life, I got to, uh, got to playing guitar more and more. And I still rather play guitar than bass. I played with Wayne in Carnegie Hall one time. Now, you told me a tale one time about backstage with, with Grandpa Jones too that wasn't too good an experience. Oh, Grandpa was playing, and we were there. We were actually playing in a band, but we, we were going to follow Grandpa, and I was out in the audience. I was He was one of my idols, and there was a couple in the audience that probably been in the bowl too much. They were pretty rowdy, and they were sort of giving him a hard time, and Wayne and I, after they came off the stage, I said, let's go backstage and speak to him. And Wayne said, I don't know. He's, he's pretty mad. He got mad on the stage. And I said, oh, we'll be all right. And I went backstage and spoke to, to, to him. I said, I really enjoyed your show. He said, I don't know what you enjoyed about it. He had all these boots and he kicked them off. One of them kicked high enough to hit the ceiling. And you also played in a Tom Dooley play. That was when we formed another band. Yes, that was Drake Walsh, that was Doc's son, and Bill Williams, and myself, and Jerry Lankford, and uh, Michelle Vadrine. We formed a band to play in the Tom Dooley play. And we did a lot of old tunes in that band. Drake was Doc's son, and he played a wonderful fiddle and mandolin. He's passed on now. <coughs> but that was a that was a good group. Then later on, later on, uh, Doc, I mean uh, Drake passed away, and uh, Vadrine dropped out, and Jerry dropped out, and Bill and I kept the band going. The name of that group was Elkville String Band, 
because it did not have a name when we were formed. And, uh, you know, it was about Tom Dooley. And Tom came from a little town up the river from here called Elkville. It's now called Ferguson. And uh, I said, well, you know, since it, we're doing it about Tom Dooley, let's just name it Elkville. So that became the name of the band. And we still sometimes play in a configuration with the Elkville band. And then after Elkville was formed, you did the uh, Otto Wood play. Yeah. That's when we started the Otto Wood play. And they did that live in North Hooksboro at the old school auditorium for two or three years. And then they moved it outside and they did away with the uh, live band, which we played in between breaks uh, when they set up the stage and changed things. And then they'd have a, a break for the musicians to play and people listen to that. So we just stayed there and played. Well, can you give any advice to some youngster that, that's taken up music? Well, uh, the best advice I can give would be uh, try to play music that has a tune to it, that has feeling to it, that has information uh, that you can relate to, to an audience. Uh, Presley Barker is a good example of that. He has taken up guitar playing and uh, Wayne and I have helped him along and he has become a fantastic guitar player and he still plays a lot of the old stuff that we played back then. That's great to pass it on to the next generation. Yeah. And so if you you can't soar with the eagles during the day if you hooted fowls at night though that's the important if you thing. Hooted, remember. That's right. <laughs> This project is made possible by a grant from the Blue Ridge National Heritage Area Partnership.